Lee Wiles asked, a topic that came up recently was electrolysis, sometimes seen on lower units. Perhaps on one of your podcasts you could discuss why this happens and how to prevent it. Thanks, Lee Richmond from Virginia. So, yeah, there's a couple of different things when it comes to um, electrolysis or corrosion or galvanic corrosion. There's basically three main types. So electrolysis is basically what everybody calls it. Everybody calls pretty much all corrosion electrolysis, even though it's not technically electrolysis. Electrolysis, I would say, is more of an electrolytic corrosion being like stray current or directly related with electricity. But the other types of corrosion that you're going to see, we'll start with the first one, which is the most simple one. It's basically just a simple electrochemical corrosion, which is just the degradation of metal. So like metal is basically taken from the earth with different minerals. It's made together and it is a man-made thing. It's a, it's a, you know, forged piece of metal. And so the metal is always trying to break down to its, you know, most basic form. That's why all of it rusts and all of it, you know, falls apart over time. It's kind of why everything, you know, people have such an issue with outboards and calling them trash and junk and crap and all this other stuff, which I actually was surprised. I'm going to do this in a podcast. How many comments we've seen about people complaining about how bad outboards are. So we'll go ahead and do that later. But for this one, that is the problem is it's metal and metal breaks down and it's just kind of what it is. So simple electrochemical, you know, corrosion is just that. It is the metal trying to break down. It's actually pretty easy to stop this because most of the time in order to stop it is just, you know, paint, clear coat, and protecting it, the metal. So if you keep the metal lubed, like oil, grease, stuff like that, and then also um, like on lower units where you're seeing it is where there's a, a chip in the paint or a scratch or something like that. So now that bare metal is, you know, touching the outside air and it's the outside air that creates this oxidization and that oxidization is what then excels the degradation of of the metal or the depleting or the rusting or whatever you want to call it. That's kind of the issue. The next most common type is galvanic corrosion and galvanic corrosion is separate in the fact that galvanic is, um, basically when you have two dissimilar metals. So if you have stainless steel and aluminum being a stainless steel bolt, holding on an aluminum lower unit to your engine, that is a dissimilar metal. And, you know, when you put those bolts in, it scratches the paint. So now you've got aluminum and stainless steel touching together. And then you take that and you stick it into an electrolytic, I guess you would, I guess that would be the right word, an electrolyte. No, it'd be like an electrolyte or an electrolytic type of substance being water that is conducive those two metals together are going to create a chemical reaction, which is galvanic corrosion. And that one, in order to combat that, what you need is anodes. So the proper protection based on your anodes is what's going to help to neutralize that as much as possible. Uh, A lot of these things, there's not much you can do because you are taking metal, you're running electricity through it, and then you're putting it into a body of water, and then you're running it. So um, there's only so much that we can do to slow down these processes, but those are the two main types being the simple electrochemical, which is, again, metal breaking down. That is just lubrication, wax, paint, keeping it clean. And then galvanic, which is dissimilar metals, touching and that is in in order to combat that is their proper anodes and just making sure that everything is as good as it can be as far as paint same thing paint lubrication grease stuff like that talking about like stainless steel like stainless a lot of people think is stainless it's not you know stain perfect it's it's going to rust and especially like 316 or 304, what is mainly used in the marine industry because it's not pure stainless steel. It has other metal built into it, which is what gives it its strength. If it was just pure stainless, then it would not have the same strength as it does with the other metals built into it. So that's kind of another issue. All 
back to the simple electrochemical corrosion issue. Now, the last one is what everybody calls electrolysis, which is really, it's an electrochemical, electrolytic corrosion is what it's called. So an electrolytic corrosion is where you have straight current or you have an electrical component being added to the problem. I'm going to say electrolysis because that's what everybody understands it as. And that's what everybody says, regardless of it really being electrolytic. So if you've got straight current, whereas you've got like in a boat, so in a boat, you've got, you know, batteries and DC current, and then that power from each battery, say you've got twins, the power from this battery goes to this engine, the power from this battery goes to this engine. And that power is always going to be trying to get back to the battery and power flows from ground to positive. So what a lot of people, you know, misunderstand, you know, you think that po the power goes from positive to negative, but it doesn't, it flows backwards. And so if you've got a problem with your ground circuit, your power circuit or anything like that, and let's say that your batteries are tied together or they're not tied together, both can cause a different problem. But the power that goes to this engine, if it can't get back to the battery, then it's going to find a way to get back to the battery. So the power is running through the entire engine. Your entire engine block to the lower unit, to the propeller, to everything is all metal on metal contact. And the electricity is running through that metal because it's using the metal as the ground, like as a ground block. So that power is going to find a way to get back to that battery. It will actually leave the metal of the engine and flow through the water to the other engine if it needs to, to get back to the battery. And it will do that th through other ways too. Like uh, most boats have a bonding circuit built into them. And the bonding circuit is a different type of grounding circuit that connects all the metal components that are going to the water. So like your through hauls, your drains, um, brackets, engine bolts, like all that different stuff is going to have a bonding wire on it. So that way, if you do have stray current and you do have a problem with that, then that bonding circuit is going to connect all these items together to help spread that load. So it doesn't just attack one item and cause a big problem. But if the power can't get from this engine back to the battery, then it's going to find a way, whether that be through, you know, one of the through hole fittings or through the other engine or whatever. And one of the problems with this is you can actually make an electro, it can, it can make a difference where it will take particles from this metal and go over to here and the particles from this metal will get left on the other metal. That's why you'll see different discolorations in the metal. Um, you'll see different kind of like coatings, I guess you would say, like you can have a brown coating, you could have a black coating, you could have a um, rainbow looking coating based on the different problem that you have of the stray current, whether that be from AC or a boat problem or, um, you know, another boat next to you has a problem, like whatever the problem may be, every different scenario could have a different outcome based on your specific problem. And that coding is actually particles or electrons or, um, yeah, let's call it particles from the other metal. So like we did it on a video the about props and this kind of similar issue. And if you take a battery and you take a penny and a quarter and you put the penny to the ground on the battery and you take the quarter and you put it to the positive, if you put them in water, it will actually connect that circuit and take the copper coating off of the penny and put it onto the quarter. And the quarter will then turn to that same bronze, copper, color that was on the penny. That's the medical, that's the metal from the penny being left on it. It's a coating. It's an electro, you know, it's an electro, I'm not sure what the exact term would be. It's an electrical coating. So um, that's kind of what's going on there. And in order to combat that or to fix that or to alleviate that, you need to make sure that the bonding circuit in the boat is, is right. And you're not using the bonding circuit as a ground, which some people will, because the biggest problem 
or the most common one is the fuel sender and people using the same ground for the fuel sender as they do for the bonding circuit. And they'll just, you know, opposed to having a ground running to the fuel sender, they'll run it straight to the bonding and use the bonding as the ground, which those two circuits should be separated and only attached at the battery. So making sure that those two are separated and then also making sure there's no stray current and making sure that your anodes on the engines are all in good condition. Anodes get overlooked a lot of times because people don't really think about it or maybe they don't understand exactly what those anodes are doing and those anodes are helping to combat this corrosion issue of galvanic and symbol electrochemical electrochemical and electrolytic corrosion so those anodes are very important and there's the right amount of anodes on the engine there's a reason why there's you know two on the lower unit one on the anti-ventilation plate one on the bracket two or three on the bracket of the power tra- tilt and trim unit there's that many for a reason because they're a specific size and they're a specific weight and they're like it is chemically manufactured in a way that it balances out the water and it balances out the I'm not, I can't think of the word what it would be but it balances everything out so for the amount of metal being the lower unit and the trim unit and all that stuff that's in the water those anodes balance out that um, ratio so the you know, it's basically neutral. And so make sure those anodes are right. Make sure there's no paint missing on the lower unit. That's going to be the best way for you to combat any kind of corrosion issue that you could see. Now, I'm sure there's someone out there that is a doctor and knows a lot more about it than me. I'm not a chemical engineer. That is just the best way that I understand it and the best way that I can hopefully try and help someone else understand it in terms that you could understand and kind of get your mind wrapped around the way that whole corrosion and electrolysis issue works. Robbie Howe, part of the problem is marketing. We are made to feel like these boats, even modest sized boats, have to be going 50 miles per hour at wide open throttle. Just a few decades ago, nobody would have even thought of a 600 horsepower outboard. 25 foot boats were being pushed with 200 horsepower outboards and nobody had two engines on a boat. A 20 foot with boat with a 150 horsepower was a lot of boat. We are wanting too much these days. That's talking about running full throttle and reliable versus unreliable and just what the market looks like as far as what people want. And yeah, I think that a lot of us has, have become spoiled in the ability to do 60, 65, 70, 75 miles an hour on the water. I mean, like that's, that is insane though. I get it. Um, I mean, who doesn't want to go faster, but granted, yeah, most of us grew up doing 30, 35, 40 and like that is, that is plenty. Um, yeah, now you've got 600, 450, 500 horsepower outboards and everybody wants to do 65. So it's like the boat brands are now thinking that 50, 60 is like, you have to have that. Otherwise your boat's not going to sell. And I don't really know if that's honestly the case. I think that the available horsepower and the reliability of the engines that are available is helping to change that where, okay, yeah, there's not much of a difference between like my 21 foot boat with a V6 200 on it is going to do 55 miles an hour just based on the efficiency, the power, the torque ratios, the propeller pitches that we're able to spin with the engines. I think that That is kind of more of like the baseline now. So companies are, because of the technology, able to have boats that that do 50, 55 as like a standard standard rate. But I'm also not a big fan of being underpowered either. I mean, if you want to have like, it's a lot better to have power and not need it than to need power and not have it. Especially when a lot of people, the way they use a boat is you load it up. I mean, the things that people take on boats now are, are just insane. Like, you know, the, the days of just having two people, one little cooler and four rods on the boat, like that's not how people use boats anymore. Now people want to have eight people on the boat with six different coolers. Both of the fish boxes packed out with ice, 12, 15 different rods, all your baits, all your, all your tackle, everything like staying on the boat. So there is a lot more weight on the boat. And so you, now you kind of need that extra horsepower opposed to being able to get away with, you know, having a 90 horse or a 115 on a 20 foot, 21 foot boat. 
um, because of how packed it is, you, you know, now you're only doing 25. You've got, you've actually got functional problems with the boat when it's underpowered, where the boat's not getting on plane. If you can't even get the boat on plane, that's a functionality problem, not necessarily just a desire problem. But yeah, I think, I still think 3540 is, is fine for the most part, for most of us to get somewhere. If you can do 30, 35 miles an hour, I mean, like that's, that's, that's pretty good. Like, it, I mean, if you're in that much of a hurry and you need that much time, then like that's a whole nother deal. So Jim's asks, any thoughts on Parson two cycles? I have an older boat that I would like to remotor. Boat came with a Johnson 85 horsepower. I understand a four cycle will be too heavy unless I drop horsepower. Yeah, that's kind of the issue with two stroke to four stroke. And then and the conversion there is the weight to horsepower ratio is still a problem when you get down to these 85, you know, anywhere from 40 to 115. That's kind of that range of like, you know, going from a two, three cylinder to a four cylinder. And, you know, it's a, it's a hundred, 150, 200 pounds in some instances, which is a lot, which is a big difference when you're talking about repowering a boat. I don't know much about Parsons. Um, I think it's a Chinese brand. I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, I didn't really know that you could even buy a two stroke in the United States anymore, but I guess you can. Uh, so that's kind of news to me. I do know I have seen Parson. They make an electric outboard. So I've only seen that cycle. I didn't realize they made four strokes and two strokes. So no, I don't really have any experience or any, um, kind of detailed information that I could give other than opinion and what I read. So, I don't know too much about them, but yeah, I would definitely going back to the being underpowered discussion. I would not want to drop horsepower just to go to the four stroke. So yeah, one of your, one of your problems there is the weight of that 85 is that 85 is a four cylinder. And so you've got a lot of power with that 85. And if you go to like a 60 or a 75 and you go down to like a three cylinder, um, you're going to lose a lot of a lot of um, the way, you know functionality to that boat. You're going to lose a lot of performance just simply going from the from the four cylinder two stroke to a say a three cylinder four stroke. I I feel for you. That's kind of a problem. So I don't I don't know. I would definitely be looking into different options. The Parson two cycles. Don't know anything about them. I mean, if you can get it, then um, your Weight to horsepower ratio is probably going to be very similar. Two strokes, it's it's a two-stroke engine, so there can't be too much about it. I mean, two-stroke technology is, um, you know, I hope they don't screw that up. As far as if it's just a plain Jane two-cycle engine, that would be, it might be your best bet. I don't know what their price is either, so maybe even the price might even go into there. JD says, just go to a state that has winters and buy a good running boat for cheap during the winter. We just talked about this uh, on a couple podcasts ago, being of a good place to find a cheap boat and hundred percent. I mean, if you can look like we were talking about being on Craigslist or Facebook, but well, yeah, if you can find something in a winter state, like if you go up North and you look for um, a deal during the winter, a lot of times there are people that have a boat that, you know, is put away for storage for the winter and they don't really use it that much and they need to sell the boat. It's a hard time to sell a boat in the middle of January when you live in Minnesota or you live in, you know, Ohio or New York or, you know, any of these other Northern places, Illinois, Indiana, any of that stuff. If you live in Michigan and you're trying to sell a boat in the middle of January, you've got limited buyers because it's snowing outside. It's freezing cold. People aren't buying boats. So, 100% you you might be able to find a really good deal if you go to one of these locations to try and find a boat because there's no other buyers up no one else is buying boats so if you know you're the only buyer then and they have to sell the boat it's the same old saying is that something is only worth as much as you can get someone to pay for it when you need to sell it so if you need to sell the boat in the middle of january in the middle of winter and there's no one else buying it um that kind of uh is an issue and unfortunate for the seller, but for you as a buyer, that's where you find a deal. That's where you can make a come up and 
That is a very good comment. Captain Dave Sport Fishing, I can tell you for a fact I used the flush port on a 250 Suzuki for four years and my fuel cooler clogged up. It never got flushed by using the flush port. I couldn't figure out what was wrong and a Yamaha Merc mechanic told me to check the fuel cooler and he was right. It was full of dirt, mud, salt from the St. John's River, Jacksonville. I have many videos about the issue on my own channel, Boat Maintenance Playlist. I would never, ever advise anybody to use those flushing ports. I mean, we're going to differ on that one because I definitely do suggest the the flushing ports, but 100% running in the St. John's, that is brackish, dirty water. I mean, like you're running in all kinds of issues with dirt, mud, and, and all kinds of other things. Yeah, that sucks that it's clogged up the fuel cooler. Um, and for whatever reason, that flush port was not flushing that fuel cooler. I know I have seen him. He likes to put it in a um, tub and run it in the in the in the can, which is, I mean, if you if you want the best way and the most efficient way to flush your outboard, then that's the way it's going to be. You're going to put it into a can full of water and even probably throw in some flush or some salt away in there as well, and that's going to be the most proficient way that you can flush an outboard. So. Definitely, if you want to learn how to do that, you can check out his channel. You know, I'm still a fan of the flush port, though, so we do differ on that aspect. But nonetheless, it did have a problem for him and his Suzuki where the flush port was not flushing the fuel cooler. So that's an issue. Dr. Ed, you need to talk more about inboards. All my friends here in Florida use them more than outboards because we have larger and faster boats. Inboard flushing needs caution, especially with closed systems, shaft seals, and seawater pumps. 100%. I don't do a lot with inboards. My inboard experience is limited. We do, I just don't have the boats to work on. A lot of our stuff is offshore, and people are wanting outboards. It's They want the ease of maintenance. But an inboard does have completely different flushing aspects to it than an outboard, whereas a lot of inboards, a lot of them do have flush ports built in, though. With newer boats, the way they are, even if you do have inboards, a lot of them do have a way where there's a flush attachment there, but most of them you have to run the engine when you are flushing them hooked up to it to get that C pump, that water pump, the closed circuit, like all the other things flushed out of it. But you definitely have to use muffs and make sure that it is flushed in a specific way depending on the inboard that you have. It is much different from an outboard, especially in northern climates whenever you're dealing with freezing temperatures like an outboard is so much easier you just tilt it down and all the water leaks out you don't have to worry about things freezing and inboard when you flush it you have to drain everything because it could freeze crack your block be a problem so yeah we'd love to bring more inboard content we just don't see a lot of them i would like to do a wakeboard or a ski boat here in the upcoming future maybe this year we'll get onto that so that would be some inboard um, content but as of right now, nothing's on the books for any inboard. Sorry about that. Rich, great discussion. Yamaha F-115 right up there with F-150 reliability, 100%. Both of those platforms, the F-15, the F-150 are, I mean, I mean that is like the pinnacle of reliability. Yamaha's F-150 is probably the most reliable engine that they've ever made. Uh, super fan. You're right with the F-115, same thing. It's very similar. It is super reliable, uh, super robust, super rigid, rigid, like it'll take abuse. Phenomenal engine, phenomenal platform. You are 100% right. I'm a big fan of the F-115, big fan of the 150. You know, Yamaha is synonymous with reliability. That's probably something that I do need to make a video on. Probably incorporate that, how most brands have something that they're known for. Uh, they become synonymous with with their name, and Yamaha is reliable. If you say Yamaha Outboard, most people are going to say reliable. John Coleman, what is your opinion on the first run of Sea Pro boats? Got a 2005 27 270 cc for a great deal. Never heard them mentioned on the good or bad from any of your podcasts. Yeah, we don't really talk much about a lot of the budget boats. I think we had a discussion about that earlier. I do need to maybe make a little segment about that with some of these budget production line boats. Just because they are a production line boat, that's kind of like uh, we just don't talk about them much but they do have their point i don't think there's anything wrong with the sea pro same thing um it's it's a good riding boat there's not much to it it's it's got a fair price on it 
the engine package that you can get with them. That's more of my concern with most boats is what's the engine on it and what's the power ratio based on the weight of the boat. And then the rest of it, you can deck out however you want between the electronics and the stereo and the lights and all that stuff. That's all on you, what you want. As far as the right of the boat, the, those early 2000s C pros, not a bad boat, not a, not a bad riding boat. They're just, you know, it's just a, it's just a regular boat. You're going to be running thirties, forties, and um, it's set up for for fishing. So I think it's a good boat. I don't have anything bad to say about it. So, you know, that's probably why we don't really talk about that much about it because it's just kind of like, yeah, that's a good boat. You know, boom, that's that's it. There's not like, oh my gosh, it's got it's th- it's so good because of X, Y, and Z. It's it's just a good boat. So if you're in that budget budget range, then not a bad boat at all. Hot shots again. What is your take? On the angler boats, particularly 2000s year range, 2400 cc, 2500 cc, no wood construction. I'm going to put the angler right back in there with the Sea Pro. That's the same thing. It's you know along that that budget line, plain Jane, good riding boat, but nothing that's like you know super spectacular. There's no like wow factor. Oh, this is an amazing boat. It's just a you know it's going to get you into boating. It's going to get you on the water. It's going to get you fishing. It's it's a good boat. There's not um, there's not a whole large discussion that could be had there. So I I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's a good boat. I would be I think that you got a good boat. That's that's kind of my opinion. Not not much there. Fireboat newer used outboards are the way to go. Last year I bought a pair of well cared for 2012 Yamaha HBI 200s. With 600 hours on them for 10,000 with like new props, rigging, and gauges. The HPI 200 has been one of Yamaha's most reliable engines. A pair of new 200s would be 40 to 50,000, a huge difference. I don't know if I would call them the most reliable, but like I said, for me, the F 150 is the most reliable engine that they ever made, even though the 42 and these larger ones. Super reliable. Not to say that the 3.3, the 225, 250, any of those were unreliable. They are reliable. I'm just saying, you know, I think the F-150 was the best. Nothing wrong with the in, the others, but 200, huge fan of the um, 200 HPDI. 100% I'm with you on there. We just had someone else that had a major catastrophic problem with his HPDI, but I think he had the 225 or 250 somewhere. He had the large one, not the 15200, which was the smaller one, which the 15200 was way more reliable than the 25300 was. In the same note, they were super fuel efficient, and not to mention the performance aspect that you're going to get out of that, that 200 HPDI compared to the performance out of the new F200 because the F200 is an inline four. So your six cylinder HPDI, you're going to get, I mean, for one, it's got two strokes. So you got more power and it's a six cylinder and it's got the same horsepower. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a steal hundred percent. I would definitely take a pair of that, especially 2012. That one's not too old yet. I mean, yeah, you're 12 years old, but you're not 20 years old. So you've got a lot of life left in those engines. I would definitely try and run those things until you can't run them no more. Super fuel efficient. Definitely maintain them and keep quality fuel in them. That was kind of the detriment to most HPDIs. Um, I would definitely be watching running stuff like ethanol or any kind of other poor fuel in there because they do like to inherently run lean. Uh, But that's not to say that they're unreliable or that you're going to have a problem. I would just say keep good fuel, run them as often as you can and um, make sure they're oiling properly. And you're going to run those things for a long time. One of, one of my favorite engines, definitely all about that. Zeke full open is full open is expensive. You can use your tachometer for a fuel gauge hundred percent. That's the perfect one to end on right there. Um, yeah, it, the, the faster you go, the more fuel you're going to burn and hundred percent, you could use your tachometer as a fuel gauge. So if you're doing wide open throttle, 6,000 RPM, you're going to be burning way more fuel. And once you learn your boat and your engine, you should be able to run that off of the tack. I only run boats on the tech. I don't look, I, I rarely, I mean, yeah, I'll look at the speed. I more monitor my RPM. 
So when I run a boat, you learn the boat as the boat is, and you know with what trim you're running your RPM and your fuel economy and the speed. So once you kind of dial those three in and you learn your boat, you kind of know where you're at as far as the trim, the seas, and how the boat runs. And I mainly look at the tachometer. I don't really look so much at the speed anymore as I do listening to the engine, looking at the fuel economy, and looking at the trim of the engines, you know, what we're trimmed up and what we're running and what we're consuming. And that's kind of how I run a boat. I don't necessarily look at the speed and say, oh, I want to do 45 miles an hour no matter what. For me, it's more of what are the sea conditions and the if you're running into the wind or you're running into the current or you're running upstream, learning the trim, learning the fuel burn, and learning the RPM of your engine is going to allow you to actually make the engine run a lot longer if you learn how, how it likes to run. Most engines, I try and run in the 4,000 RPM range, anywhere from 35 to 47 maybe that's like i would say is most engines cruising speed maybe 38 to 48 somewhere in there around the 4000 4500 that's most engine boat package cruising speed when you're underpowered and you've got a lot of weight in the boat then cruising speeds end up being in the 5000 5500 rpm range but by and large i would say that you want to be you know Learn your boat is what I guess what I would try and say is to learn your boat, learn what the tack is, learn what the RPM is, learn what your fuel burn is, learn how to trim it uh, based on the engine height. Hopefully yeah, your engines are mounted at the right height and you can get some trim in there to get some lift on the back of the boat to get more of the boat out of the water and get on top of the water. And that's going to give you the best experience, the best fuel economy and make your engines last the longest. So for this week, we'll go ahead and shut it down. If you want to talk about something, drop it in the comments below. Email us at askbab at bornagainboating.com. Check out our boaters program. It helps support us at bornagainboating.com. And we will see you next week.